of a few this is in every nation and so it's a good passage yes a lot of the passages they use for their proof are misuses of those passages yeah okay we're going to go on tonight to another one another idea You'll see what they believe about original sin and total depravity. Now you're going to say, oh, they don't believe that. Oh, yes, they do. And by the way, while you're at it, Catholicism accepts the same idea of original sin. Our first parents, this is from the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. I introduced it to you last week. It is accepted by most Baptist churches. There may be some exceptions. They may rule out one phrase or another phrase, but we'll see it's accepted by many of them. Our first parents, by this sin, Adam and Eve's sin, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and we in them, whereby death came upon all. So all becoming dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. So we inherited the same sin as Adam and Eve. We were holy, we are wholly defiled. They go on. They being the root and by God's appointment standing in the room and stead of all mankind said they were there in the place of all mankind. The guilt of the sin was imputed. All right? They took Adam's sin and put it on you. Was imputed. Uh, and corrupted nature conveyed. You have a corrupt nature. To all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. Being now conceived in sin, and by nature children of wrath. By the way, that's a partial reference to two of their favorite passages that they're misusing. The servants of sin, the subjects of death, and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal, unless the Lord Jesus set them free. There it is. You are totally depraved. You inherited the sin of Adam. 
before you did anything, from this original cor corruption, where, whereby, now notice this, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good. You can't even do anything good. You're totally depraved and wholly inclined to all evil. You got that? You are totally depraved. Do proceed all actual transgressions. This corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are doth remain in those that are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mollified, I think there's an extra letter there, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. So it doesn't matter that you're a sinner, you're going to still be a sinner. But uh, Christ pardoned and moderated your sin. Now then, let's go on a little bit further. This is from the, this is from the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Westminster Confession of Faith is used by most Presbyterian churches who are also Calvinists. Now there's been a lot of changes that they've made. Some of them are barely religious these days, but anyway. They being the root of mankind, Adam and Eve, the guilt of this sin was imputed, and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by our original generation, came to everybody. Now, if you're paying attention, you might notice a little bit of uh, scotching in that phrase. Everybody who, everybody who descended from them by original generation. What would you think that they're trying to get around? No. There's one person that wasn't guilty of sin and they know it. And wasn't guilty of original sin. Who would that have been? Jesus. So their argument will be. That he didn't descend from Adam and Eve. By original generation. Because Joseph wasn't his father. Okay. Just giving you a little warning there. From this original corruption. Whereby we, he did come through Eve. And uh, the, you, this is a problem, let me back up. This is a problem that the Calvinist has, and it's a problem that, by the way, the, the, Westman, or the uh, Philadelphia Confession said the same thing. And the Catholics have. They have to explain how in the world Jesus, who came down here as a man, was not guilty of original sin, and thereby totally depraved. Now, they do it by saying, well, Joseph wasn't his father. The Catholics do it by saying that, and, but you know, you still have the problem that Mary was his mother. So, the, whatever that gene of, whatever that, that inheritance is, half of it would come through the mother. And so, they have that problem. And the Catholics get around that by going back to Mary's parents and talking about an immaculate conception. That somehow or other Mary was conceived by the direct action of God and thus was immaculate from original sin. And therefore, Jesus was the child of God and the child of a person conceived by immaculate conception. They had to work on that pretty hard, didn't they? <laughs> but anyway, go on with me. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good. This is the Westminster Confession. To, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. Totally depraved. 
Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good. You can't do anything good. You can't. You can't will to do anything good. Accompanying salvation. And so as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good, and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereto. You can't even believe by yourself. Did you know that? That's their doctrine. We'll find out more about that on, on the way. But that's why they argue that faith itself is a gift of God. You don't decide to believe anything. We're gonna, we'll go on to it. The Holy Spirit is going to give you the miraculous gift of faith. You can't make the decision. This is from the uh, Southern Baptist message of the year, I believe this is 2000. I don't, don't think they've changed it since 2000. In the man, beginning, man was innocent of sin and was endowed by his creator with freedom of choice. We had choice then. By his free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherit a nature and an environment inclined toward sin. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. Now, they're working a little bit. They work a little differently than the straight Calvinist to deal with what becomes of the babies. What becomes of the babies? Now, the straight Calvinist says that if your child is among the elect, they're saved at whatever age they die. If your child isn't too bad. The uh, Southern Baptists are trying to work on that a little bit because that's, that's sort of depressing <laughs> if you think about that for very long. They say as soon as they are capable of moral action. Uh, what's, what's the word that I've been known to use? Uh, in the, basically the same thing that a child reaches a age of accountability where he's capable of making moral decisions. And at that point, he needs to be a Christian. But, uh, let me go a little further. This is a Baptist church. This is a pretty, pretty strict Baptist church in Latonia, Kentucky, Kentucky, which is on the other side of Cincinnati, on the Kentucky side of Cincinnati. Calvary, it, my children, my grandchildren have gone to school at their public school, or it's not a public school, but their school for a few years. Calvary is uh, the home. Many of you have gone down and seen the, uh, can you think of it, the ark. What's the other one? Creation Museum, and at Calvary, at least members from Calvary, especially Ken Ham, who's associated with Calvary, have, are the guiding light behind the Ark and uh, the Creation Museum. If you've been to Creation Museum, there's another doctrine that you will see if you read actually those exhibits in the Creation Museum, you're going to read Calvinist doctrine. And Calvary believes in predestination, which not all Baptist churches do. You keep reading there as you go through the Creation Museum, you're going to find that too. But here's what their statement of faith is. We believe that man was created in the image of God, 
and in innocence. However, by his voluntary transgression of the law of God, man fell into sin and incurred not only physical death, but also spiritual death, which is separation from God. All human beings are born with a sinful nature and are therefore under the just condemnation of God. So you have inherited Adam's sin and uh, have inherited that condemnation. All right, we're going to look at one more. This is from that Bible Chapel of Delhi Hills over in Cincinnati, which is pretty well a straight five-point five Calvinist church, Baptist church. They say, we believe that Adam fell from his original righteousness into sin and brought upon himself and all his offspring death, condemnation, and sinnership. We believe it is utterly beyond the power of fallen man to love God, to keep his laws, to understand the gospel, to repent of sin, or trust in Christ beyond your power to do that. That's Calvinism. And so, uh, if you're going to be a member of one of these churches, they're going to ask you about your experience. And you're going to go, what do you mean, my experience? I, I went to high school, and I went <laughs> that's not the experience they're talking about. They want to know when the moment when the Holy Spirit entered into you and gave you the gift of faith and called you to repentance. Now, some Baptist churches, by the way, will believe that repentance is before faith. That a man is called to repent and then he's given the call of faith. Uh, so, you need to... You, depending on who you're talking to, you need to be aware of that dichotomy. Uh, come on here. And thereby, since you finally have been given a call to repentance and a gift of faith, you can finally love God, keep His laws, and understand the gospel. Now, sometimes they'll say that there are some Men who are not elect but are totally depraved can sort of for a time fake that. They can fake it. Uh, and that uh, they can act like they believe and they can be righteous, but uh, they're really not righteous and they're not going to uh, be saved because they're not among the elect. Uh, they do, it would be irresponsible of me to suggest that they are uh, rebellious because they will stress that if you're among the elect, you ought to be good and righteous and faithful and loving and so forth. But if you don't show those qualities, maybe you'll get around to them later on because you're the elect and so forth. And as long as you've been given the gift of faith, what, no matter how you behave or how much you sin, because you're still going to sin, because you're still uh, guilty of sin and, uh, as a human being and only, uh, only exist because of God's righteousness has been, Christ's righteousness has been imputed to you. Now then, it's your turn. How... What passage would you use to, wait a minute, I want to go, no, yeah, that's as far as I want to go. How would you defeat that? Any suggestions? Bible passage? Okay. Yeah, go ahead and read it.
Yeah. Uh, verses 19 and 20, I think, are pretty powerful. He says, Yet say you, why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father, who was unrighteous? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. It's a pretty powerful passage. You know, uh, I appreciate that. I'm going to tell you what their response is. I debated the man here once. And uh, I was, I could have used Acts 2. Acts 2 would have been good just as you've used it. I was using Acts 10. Where uh, he says that uh, Cornelius was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. Gave much alms to the people, prayed to God all way. And uh, he says, send men to Joppa, you know, in verse 6. He shall, t to Simon, he'll tell you what to do. And uh, so on through this. And so I pointed out that uh, uh, Cornelius knew that he needed to do something. And... Uh, He's told something to do in order to be saved. For instance, in chapter 11, he says over here, uh, he says in verse 14, after he, he sent for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So he wasn't saved. He wasn't among the elect. He wasn't saved. He needed to be saved good man that he might be, how in the world he got to be good being totally depraved is kind of hard to understand, but he was, he was going to be saved if he listened to the words that Peter told him. The Baptist argued, get this, that Cornelius was saved before Peter ever got there, and that all Peter was doing was telling him the good news, that he had been saved. Yes, there are little lights. For instance, that, uh, that for instance, the statements in uh, this chapter, where it talks about, you remember the vision Peter saw? It says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, I've not ever eaten anything common or unclean. And God says to him, what God cleans, call not common or unclean. And then he tells this man, hey, there's something you need to do to be saved. So uh, Cornelius could make a decision. He had made a decision. He wasn't totally depraved. And uh, when, he, but when he met Peter, he could make a decision. And uh, he says that in every nation, he that feareth in him worketh righteousness is accepted. Certainly not, well, you don't have to do anything. You've already been saved. So, this doctrine makes simple Bible passages virtually ununderstandable. Uh, so, it's something that oh, we ought to think about a little bit. Um, let me get back here. There. Uh, let me see. Uh, <laughs> Where do I want to go? Where did I move him to? Oh, he's not here. I don't see him. Oh. <laughs> I've lost.
lost the slide that I wanted to save, but I'll get it added back in at some point. Um, what time is it? I've got just a few minutes. Let's, let's notice this. Uh, this is just a single chart, and I have a, about five, five or ten minutes to add this to our discussion. I want you to look at what they say, just by way of interest, about the purpose of baptism. This is from the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be unto the party baptized a sign of his fellowship with him. It's not the sign that makes him in fellowship. He's already in fellowship and so it's a sign of his fellowship. This is what they teach. A sign of his fellowship in his death and resurrection. Of his being, or having been, engrafted on, into him. A sign of the fact that he's had a remission of sins. And of giving up into God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. That's what the Philadelphia Confession of Faith says about baptism. It is not for the remission of sins. It is not a requirement in order to be saved. It is just a sign of uh, the fact that you're already saved. So, you know, they, it is a Baptist church, so they baptize everybody that gets into the Baptist church. But it is a sign you've already been saved. You've already been voted in, on in the church. You've already given evidence of your calling, uh, your, the fact that the Holy Spirit came down on you and saved you. And so that's what it is. This is from the uh, Westminster Confession. Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church. That's how you get into the Baptist church. You've got to be baptized into it. You don't get into it by faith. You've got to be into it by baptism. But also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. That you've already received God's grace. Of his engrafting into Christ that you've already been engrafted. Of regeneration. You've already been regenerated. Of the remission of sins. And of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ. To walk in newness of life. Which sacrament is. By Christ's own appointment. To be continued in his church. Until the end of the world. These are Baptists you know. Dipping of the person in the water. Is not necessary. But baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling. This is the Westminster Confession. I thought you'd like to see this. These are Presbyterians. Dipping of the person into the water is not necessary. But baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling upon the person. That's how they believe you're baptized is by pouring and sprinkling. Not only those that actually do that do actually profess faith in and obedience unto Christ, but also the infants of one of both believing parents are to be baptized. There's infant baptism in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So you remember why they baptized infants? You and I say, hey, they, they have to be believers. But they don't have to be believers. They're elect. They're elect children. Now, how they know they're elect, I don't know. They don't know, for that matter. But that's why they baptize babies, because they've already been saved. Are you with me here? <laughs> In case you've ever been wondering what their doctrine really is, this is it. This is Presbyterians. The Baptists think you've got to be baptized as a if you've heard them express it, they talk about an outward sign of an inward grace. That you've already been saved, and so it's an outward sign that you've already been saved. Because they do believe that to get into the Baptist church, you need to be baptized. But you don't have to be in the Baptist church to be saved. 
And so you don't have to be baptized. It's not incumbent upon you. Anyway, you might consider that just a little bit. Anybody think of a passage that might give the light of that? This isn't really hard. You've heard this virtually every sermon I've ever preached. That's which passage is that? Ah. First Peter three twenty one. The like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Naaman wasn't cleansed until he got in that water seven times. Yep. What? What is it, Ruth? Acts 22? Yeah. Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's Acts twenty two sixteen. Any others? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> let me tell you what's interesting about Mark 16. We can study about that with you one of these days. Uh, some of them I have known, I've heard, argue that Mark 16 doesn't belong in the Bible. And uh, some of the revised versions put it in the Bible, but they put it in italics. But I've debated this subject many times. Maybe either I debated 10 or 12, 10 or maybe 10 times. I've been with others who debated it, perhaps maybe a total of, 15 debates on baptism. I have never once heard a Baptist preacher in debate make that argument. I got all kinds of ammunition to defeat it, but uh, I've never heard a Baptist, Baptist preacher in debate make the argument. They know it won't stand up. For instance, it's in the King James, and most of the conservative Baptists really love the King James. <laughs> It's one of their problems. Uh, also, uh, uh, the, it's real easy to make the point. The same version or the same manuscript, the uh, Sinaitic, which is the Westcott, the Westcott and Hork translation. Uh, okay, let's back up. There's two basic Greek manuscripts. The Textus Receptus, which was formulated early on. The King James Version of the Bible was translated from that. That was the Greek. Uh, the, the Greek that, that uh, the King James was translated from. And then in the late 1800s, another manuscript was discovered on Sinai in a monastery there. And it was referred to as the Sinaitic Westcott and Hort, who examined it and discovered it and popularized it, created another Greek manuscript called the Westcott and Hort text. And several of the modern translations have been based on the Westcott and Hort text. And that's why in most of the revised versions, you'll see it in italic or footnoted. Because the, from verse eight on in Mark, that, uh, that text is not in Sinaiticus, but look at Mark. There, there are two or three easy things to study this with. I can give you some harder ones. We can do that at some time if you'd like. But I'm going to get over here to Mark here eventually. Look at Mark 16. The Sinaiticus has Mark 16 ending at verse 8. And it looks like a page was torn from the manuscript. 
verse 8 says, Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Do you really think that Mark ended his gospel saying they were afraid? It's just really hard to imagine. Now, the other thing is that the Sinaiticus manuscript also, there's several other parts of the Bible that are not in it. Notably, the book of Revelation is not in it. And that manuscript is dated. You know, you think, well, it's a, it's a manuscript. It should be dated near the first or second century. It isn't. It's dated, I believe, in the 300s. So it, it's not the latest information. It's just the latest thing that's been discovered. And uh, we could go into that in more detail. But that's why I think no Baptist preacher of my acquaintance in several debates ever was brave enough to make the argument. Uh, so, I appreciate your attention, and we'll go a little further in this next week into uh, faith only, grace only, and... Uh, We'll go into perseverance of the saints, the idea of once saved, always saved, and faith only and grace only, which uh, should begin to finish us out with this portion of this study so that you know, pardon me, from the horse's mouth exactly what this Calvinistic doctrine is. Uh, I hate being this... this being far away from you people on the back row is bad enough, but I had to back up way here. We haven't got